recently about this concern that the Democratic Party may be having in reference to RFK Jr. possibly weakening Joe Biden. Now, where would he weaken Joe Biden right now? Apparently, it's on the war issue, the anti-war message, which this war with Russia and Ukraine is not as popular with the American people as I think the Biden administration thought it would be, especially the billions of dollars that have gone out the door to Ukraine. More people were criticizing it. Some people that weren't criticizing it in the beginning and did support it, even some of those people have now started to flip and say, okay, enough is enough. Like, this is ridiculous, right? So they had this discussion, a panel discussion on CNN about how they feel RFK Jr. is actually hurting Joe Biden. Now, my thing is, is this, if you're not good on the war issue, that's Joe Biden's fault. Joe Biden should try to be strong on that issue, but he's not going to be. He's a warmonger, just like all the ones that came before him. He's status quo. That's why he's in the White House. But I want you to hear what they said. Cause I thought this was, this is pretty interesting. Now shout out to case steady QB for this clip case has been killing it. CNN discussing RFK jr. Calling for the U S to stop the provocation and seek peace with Russia. Listen to this. There's a couple of clips here. Democratic presidential candidate, Robert F. Kennedy jr. Is speaking out tonight about the war in Ukraine and calling on the U S to stop in his words, provocations of Russia. I abhor. Russia's brutal and bloody invasion of that nation. But we must understand that our government has also contributed to its circumstances through repeated, deliberate provocations of Russia going back to the 1990s. Is RFK Jr. presenting a problem for Joe Biden? My panel is back. Coleman, um, RFK Jr.'s poll numbers are at 20% right now. So Biden's at 60%. Mm. RFK Jr. 20%, Marianne Williamson 8%, someone else 8%. So I know that you you think that Democrats shouldn't sort of laugh this off. Yeah. Let's look at this poll for just a second right here. If Joe Biden were not the incumbent, people would look at this a little bit differently, right? But he's the incumbent. How do you allow someone to pull 20%? And for people who think this isn't much, this is significant. That is huge. I've never seen this in my lifetime. I've never seen this. So 20% that they are pulling away, or he's pulling away, and Marianne's pulling away 8%. Together, they're pulling away 28%. And then there's that other 8% that said somebody else. What does that say about your job as president? What does that tell you about what Joe Biden has been doing? What does that say, people? Let's go on. Shouldn't sort of laugh this off. Yeah, no, I, I don't think Democrats should. I think Democrats, I worry, will make a similar mistake that was made with Trump, which is he seems like a clown. He's saying all this crazy stuff. He's an outsider. His fans seem taken in by misinformation. Let's just wish that this goes away by not taking it seriously. And then I have to pause here for a second so I can tell you who this gentleman is. So Coleman Hughes, if I'm not mistaken, I, I thought Coleman Hughes was a conservative. So just keep that in mind. OK, for those of you who are not familiar with him, just keep that in mind. And we're all blindsided. Right? And what I mean, might happen if they don't take him seriously? Well, what, what I, I think, frankly, he appeals to a lot of people, and we should make an, a serious effort to understand why. Right? Obviously, I watched the whole I, I watched the whole Joe Rogan episode. A lot of his ideas are just absolutely kooky, unfounded. Right? But he's also speaking to a very real uh, resentment that people feel of the government's handling of COVID. And you know, we know uh, the pharmaceutical industry is the number one lobbyer, um, and you know, the CDC, the FDA, NIH, unfortunately, there's a revolving door and regulatory capture and corruption that's legal. And people feel enormous resentment about how that led to policies that were heavy handed. And RFK is speaking to that. So 
Democrats could do one of two things. They can just focus on his like really, you know, looniest claims and just dismiss this guy's crazy. Or they could come up with a, a counter narrative that's like, we care about that stuff, too, but we have a better way to solve it. Thoughts? Well, when we so I think that's a good point, what he just mentioned there. And, and they're not even trying to, again, <laughs> because they don't want to have primary debates. They're not even trying to respond to it. You know, they're not even trying to defend by they, I mean, the Democrats, they're not even trying to defend their position in, in reference to where RFK Jr. stands. They're not even trying to. The way they could do it is talk about, you know, the fact that Biden administration has been pushing the left. Okay, and we're going to go to the second clip here because it's a thread. And it picks up here. Or prescription drug costs against uh, the, the, the wishes of, of, of said drug companies. But look, it, it's clear, polling has shown for a long time, that there is a desire for an alternative to Joe Biden for a variety of different reasons among Democrats. His numbers are not as high as they should be for a typical incumbent president. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that uh, Bobby Kennedy Jr. is the solution to that. The fact he's getting pumped up, particularly by folks on the right, as a credible alternative to Joe Biden, I think speaks to uh, who he most appeals to. That doesn't mean there's not Venn diagram overlap. There were B Bernie Sanders, Donald Trump fans mm -hmm. in, in the world. Um, and, and so, no, he should not be dismissed, but his claims need to be interrogated in a fact-based way. Mm -hmm. and, and when they are, many of his strongest claims break down upon the, the, the slightest bit of scrutiny. But, but that's not going to stop his supporters from supporting him. This is the same mistake that I think that the Democratic Party made with Donald Trump. And media as well. Media made this mistake with Donald Trump when he ran against Hillary Clinton. They really thought that if they called out, you know, criticized Donald Trump's statements and some of the rhetoric that he had, they really thought that, you know, his supporters would wake up and say, oh, fuck, no, not this guy. Did not happen. Did not happen. So they still don't get that. They still don't understand that, like, by criticizing RFK Jr.'s position on the jab, that doesn't pull his supporters away from him. Most likely, most of his supporters already know where he stands on that issue. So if they had a problem with that, they wouldn't be supporting him in the first damn place. This, this idea does not work. It's not going to pull people away from RFK Jr. because you call him crazy or you call him kooky or whatever. If anything, that's going to make some of them start to look at you a certain kind of way and say, why are you so, so busy trying to smear this guy so much? That's going to make them look at CNN and question their motives. He sounds very convincing because he's inundated himself with this stuff. Well, 2008, a gentleman by the name of Barack Obama was not taken seriously. He was very low in the polls and the Clinton said, okay, don't attack him. He'll be our HUD secretary someday. I went on to become president. Uh, Barack Obama was chosen by Wall Street though. <laughs> Make sure you mention that, Tony. Make sure you tell them that Barack Obama was chosen by Wall Street and he was also establishment and he was status quo. So they were okay with Obama. Let's just keep it real. Uh, 2016, Donald Trump not taken seriously by anybody uh, candidates I work for, Scott Walker, Jeb Bush, he'll flame out of the race. He'll say something destructive. We thought the McCain incident was going to cause that, became the president. I don't think RFK Jr. becomes the president, but he could do heavy damage to the president. He could weaken him going and, into the... And into there's the an election. additional factor. So they got to go after him now. Yeah, the, the, and there's an additional factor, too, which is the halo effect of his name. Not just his last name, but about his father. You know, you know Robert F. Kennedy... Hades holds a, a very sacred place in the memory of this country, in part because he was able to create coalitions, uh, particularly among African-Americans and poor working class whites that no other candidates really been able to cobble together. And the fact that his, of course, uh, he was assassinated 55 years ago this month. Um, and so that itself, I think, lends him uh, an authority on the surface that, you know, you, you should not underestimate at yourself. I, 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 I like RFK Jr., by the way. The of the support as I like people who like the name Kennedy or, or as Coleman said, people who are actually resonating with the message mm -hmm. uh, and people who just want anyone but Biden. I was actually intrigued by Julian Castro's uh, comments today, not signaling necessarily a run, but saying, you know, we need the Biden hasn't delivered on these promises, saying the kinds of things that a primary opponent is supposed to say. I mean, it seems to me that a rational OK, and then we'll go into the next clip. But I do just want to say something here when they talk about weakening Joe Biden, you know, even before RFK Jr. announced he was running and before Marianne announced she was running, Biden had already weakened himself 
why Biden like weakens himself when he makes press conferences and he doesn't know where he's at, calls people the wrong names. Like he, everybody can see that there's a, a issue there in reference to cognitive decline. Biden weakens himself when he doesn't fulfill his campaign promises. Uh, when we have high inflation in this country, when people are struggling to pay for groceries, when he kicked all those people off of Medicaid, when he lift the emergency status of, of the pandemic. So the thing is, is this, is that Biden really don't need any help making himself look bad. That, this is reality of the situation. But again, like I said, if the Democratic Party was that concerned about it, if the DNC was that concerned about it, then if anything, they would want to have some type of debate so that Joe Biden can respond to some of these things. But they just kind of want to keep Biden tucked away as much as possible because he keeps embarrassing himself at public appearances. Actual Democrat running against Joe Biden might have a, a real chance. Do you think RFK Jr. does hurt Biden somehow? I mean, the, his, his posters say I'm a Kennedy Democrat. Like, that's good advertising. But beneath that advertising is someone who's way out of step with the Democrat Party. Democratic Party. On He's already hurting. Him. He's already hurting. Him. How? He's very likable, and he has a message that's reaching a demography that the president needs. And if he gets 10, 12, 15, 20 percent of the vote, uh, the Republicans will say, you know, this guy's weak, even in his own base. And you could get a strange candidate on the Republican side that goes after the RFK people. It's not impossible. That, I guess, is actually the bigger threat, that, right? That's the, the crossover. Yeah. We not, got Bernie yep. Sanders voters, by the that's way, right. in 2016. The mainstreaming of like wild anti-vax conspiracy theories, the mainstreaming of this kind of both sizing on Russia, Ukraine. That I think is exactly right. This lends ammunition to a future Republican yeah. candidate. Yeah, this is this is. I'm sorry. I, I, again, I'm sorry. This focus of smearing RFK Jr. as anti-jab, which RFK Jr. has said multiple times that he is not, but that focus is not going to take his supporters away from him. <laughs> okay. Most people aren't even thinking everyday working class people. If I were to tell them what media is saying about RFK Jr. Oh yeah. They're saying he's anti people would just look at me and be like, and I care about this because why? The, the everyday working Joe Schmo is not thinking about this. So I think it just, it's a mistake. It is an absolute mistake to focus on that. That is not going to help Joe Biden. The, the, the code pink Donald Trump overlap on foreign policy, which, which we, you know, but, but the framing of, of I'm a Kennedy Democrat speaks to something different. That tradition means to people a certain patriotic liberalism um, that I think is, is open and Bob, this Kennedy's uh, policies don't actually back up. But the fact he's got 20% does speak to a certain looks softness in Joe Biden's approval rate. It, 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 there's a he looks softness. Kennedy-esque on camera. Well, he and does, yeah, and he, he can and look he, and like whatever you he want. Seems strong and, 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 and he Sometimes comes across much stronger and much more, uh, you know, able than, than Joe Biden. All right, we'll leave it there, guys. So let, let me tell you, I'm going to show you something. RFK Jr. actually had a speech in New Hampshire where he talked about foreign policy. When it comes to the war issue, he is very strong on this issue. This is something him and Dr. West have in common. They're strong on the anti-war issue. So it's just to me, it's like if people are struggling with whether or not they're going to support Joe Biden again, they're probably looking for someone who is different, right? They're not looking for someone who's saying the same things as Joe Biden saying, if that's the case, you might as well just support Joe Biden. But this is where he is strong. And I want you to hear some of this because I got to tell you, I really believe that if you went out and, and didn't just poll people who have landlines, by the way, a lot of people, especially Gen Z, climate activists, et cetera, tired of these damn wars. There have been multiple anti-war rallies where people have come across different political ideologies. They've come together for that one message. And there are people in this country that have become single issue voters. Why is that? Because their needs have not been met. And one of the needs to them, which they may feel is the most important, that's what they're deciding to focus on. And for some people in this country, the anti-war issue, that's number one. 
And if you come correct with that, you got their support. If you are a single issue voter, why are you supporting Joe Biden? And what would you, what issue would you focus on to support him? Think about this, people. We have Joe Biden right now. So if you're a single issue voter, what are the issues that Joe Biden brings to the table that would make you say, I'm going to vote for Joe Biden because of this issue? He didn't fulfill the student loan debt cancellation promise. He didn't do that. He didn't expand health care. He didn't do that. He promised to do that too. He didn't promise Medicare for all, but he promised to expand health care. He didn't do that either. So don't forget about the single issue voters. Listen to part of this speech. The nation that November turned the nation down another path. His successors have launched one war after another, along with the ceaseless expansion of our military. Some call it the forever war. Americans used to identify herself as a peaceful nation. In fact, our founding, the framers of our constitution said that America, believed that America, that democracy was inconsistent with an imperium abroad. That if we tried to make ourselves an imperial nation abroad, that we would turn into a surveillance state, a garrison state, a security state at home. And that we would also destroy our economy. We would drain it as, as happens with every empire. Every empire ends itself through the expansion of the military, over expansion of its military abroad. And if you look at our economy right now, what's happening? Professor Wolf has talked about this multiple times, that the American empire is crumbling, right? So all of the investment, all the money poured into the military industrial complex, poured into that defense budget, billions of dollars spent on destroying other countries, people. And look what's happening to our economy. It was only a matter of time. And the, the founders knew that. John Quincy Adams spoke for all of them when he said, America goes not abroad in search of monsters to destroy. Today, I want to recall that memory because this forever war, which has so drained our nation's vitality, now threatens to plunge the world into the unspeakable horror of nuclear Armageddon. And I speak, of course, of the situation in Ukraine. I abhor Russia's brutal and bloody invasion of that nation. But we must understand that our government has also contributed to its circumstances through repeated deliberate provocations of Russia going back to the 1990s. I can't think of one Democrat in Congress right now that's willing to say what he just said about our government's role in these wars. Yeah, some of them, Jamal Bowman will say he's anti-war, but uh, you don't vote that way. So you, you have to pay close attention to that. That piece is especially important. People may argue about, you know, whether or not Russia was right to invade or not. Like you may disagree with him on that. But this piece right here where he talks about how the U.S. government was involved in this and it goes all the way back to the 1990s. I'd say it even goes back further than that. But that's important to say. And that's important for people to hear. Joe Biden is not saying that and he's not going to say that. He's going to protect the U.S. government at all costs. So you have to you have to be willing to call it out. This is the big difference here. Democratic and Republican administrations have pushed NATO to Russian supporters, violating our own solemn promise from the early 90s when we pledged that if Russia made this terrible concession of moving 400,000 troops out of East Germany and allowing the unification of Germany under a NATO army, a hostile army, that we would commit that after that, we would not move NATO one inch to the east. And James Baker gave that assurance, as did the British uh, government officials and many, many others. And yet, today, we have surrounded Russia. We have moved it not one inch to the east, but a thousand miles. 
and 14 nations. Mm -hmm. We have surrounded Russia with missiles and military bases, something that we would never tolerate if the Russians did that to us. And that's the piece I think that should hit home for a lot of people that I want you to try to think about. This fact that imagine if it was happening to the United States. Imagine if Russia, if their military was surrounding the U.S. the way that we have these 800 military bases all around the world. Imagine if it was us in that position. Maybe hard to think about because that's not the way that it's been. But try to put yourself in those other countries. Try to put yourself in their shoes. And statements from our government officials and think tanks lay out the goals for the Ukraine war. Regime change in Russia. The overthrow of Vladimir Putin. This is what President Biden has said. Is there our purpose in the Ukraine? The disabling and exhaustion of the Russian military. You have to be willing to say that. You have to be willing to call that out. Yes, this is an attempt at regime change. That's what it's really about. People are afraid to say that. The regressives in Congress won't say that. Jamal Bowman said at the event in D.C., we got to drag this guy over the finish line. No, you don't. No, you don't. They won't say that. Ro Khanna won't say that even though he signed that letter saying that he himself and others were very much concerned about the rise of Nazification in countries like Ukraine and Poland. Ro Khanna won't say that. AOC won't say that. Jamal Bowman won't say that. Biden not going to say it. Bernie don't want to say it. You see the difference? And the dismembering of the Russian Federation. None of these objectives have anything to do with helping the Ukraine, which, of course, was the pretext for our involvement in the war. That's when our leaders told us that we were there for a humanitarian mission. But they it was never about helping those people. We were told the same thing with Afghanistan. We were told the same thing with Iraq. We got to help protect the women and the children, people. We got to protect them. If you were really trying to protect them, you would stay out of their country. And you wouldn't kill innocent civilians. They've since acknowledged that there is a broader geopolitical agenda and that Ukraine is simply a pawn in a, in a proxy war between the United States and Russia. Like teenagers playing World of Warcraft, these warmongers inside U.S. leadership draw up war games and scenarios and and pretend that a nuclear war is winnable that is a dangerous lie mm -hmm. it's an illusion that my uncle's defense secretary robert mcnamara called mass psychosis these individuals do not appreciate what john f kennedy understood when he said that of nuclear war quote all that we have built all that we have worked for would be destroyed in the first 24 hours even one nuclear explosion spreads radio radioactivity around the world. Can you imagine the consequence of a full nuclear exchange? President Kennedy did. That's why he said, quote, above all, while defending our own vital interests, nuclear powers must avert those confrontations which bring an adversary to a choice of either humiliating, humiliating retreat of a nuclear war and nuclear war. To adopt that kind of course in the nuclear age would be evidence of the bankruptcy of our policy or a collective death wish for humanity. Let me say that again. Nuclear powers must avert those confrontations which bring an adversary to a choice of either humiliating retreat or a nuclear war. The same, the shameful fact is that for the last 20 years, the advocates of a militaristic foreign policy within the U.S. leadership have done exactly the opposite. Their belligerent strategy of maximum confrontation extends beyond Russia to China, where the same group within our government hopes to use Taiwan as a geopolitical pawn, the same way they used Iraq and Syria and now Ukraine, to further a vain fantasy of world domination through violent confrontation. 
let's leave off geopolitical geopolitics for a moment and take the matter of war and peace a little deeper. President Kennedy understood that peace begins with our basic attitudes and beliefs. He spoke of the futility of passively waiting for the other side to become enlightened. We quote, we must examine our own attitudes, he said, mm -hmm. as individuals and as a nation, for our attitude is as essential to theirs. End quote. He, we should, he said, begin by looking inward. Yes, back in 1963, a politician really said that. A political leader. A political leader voiced what would be considered today a spiritual maximum or a spiritual principle. Let's take up that call from 60 years ago and ask Americans, all of us, to re-examine our attitude. We have been immersed in a foreign policy discourse that is all about adversaries and threats and allies and enemies and domination. 100%. 100%. We have become addicted to comic book good versus evil narratives that erase complexity and blind us to the legitimate motives and the legitimate cultural and economic concerns and the legitimate security concerns of other peoples and other nations. We have internalized and institutionalized a reflex of violence as the response for any and all crises. Everything becomes a war war on drugs, the war on terror. War and the war on drugs was a failure, complete failure. But this is the way that our government has approached situations. This is the way our government has approached conflict. We have to go to battle. We need to declare a war on this. This is the only way they seem to respond. But there's profit in that. On cancer, war on climate change, this way of thinking predisposes us to wage endless wars abroad, wars and coups and bombs and drones and regime change operations and support for paramilitaries and juntas and dictators. None of this has made us safer and none of it has burnished our leadership or our moral authority. But more importantly, we must ask ourselves, is this really who we are? Is this what we want to be? Is that what Americans founders envision? Joe Biden would not make this statement. You can watch the entire, I'm not going to play the entire speech because it is longer, but you can watch the entire speech on uh, NTD, Democratic presidential candidate RFK Jr. delivers foreign policy speech. Uh, so you can watch the rest of it. But he taught, he brings up the American, you know, the founding fathers and, and that type of thing. And uh, Lucy uh, actually discussed this on RBN, uh, Lucy and Roger Meadows. And it was Lucy that actually brought this to my attention that the founding fathers didn't even want political parties because they felt that it would be divisive, that you would put people in different camps. You wouldn't have direct democracy. Is this what the American people want? Is this what we really want to be as a country? Is this what we want to be known for? What do the people have to say? That speech in particular is a powerful speech. You get a chance, listen to the rest of it. But on this particular issue, that is miles ahead of where Joe Biden is. Miles ahead. It is obvious when it comes to this, the war issue, he knows a lot about this. He's studied it. He's also done the research. Like this, you can tell is obviously is something that he's very passionate about. Now, yes, there's his position on like the jab and all that kind of stuff, yada, yada. But if I were him, my focus, my number one 
would be that. The anti-war message. Everybody has their, their issue, right? Like Bernie Sanders, his big issue was Medicare for all. And that's what he focused on a lot, right? So if I was RFK Jr., I wouldn't even go down the rabbit hole of the whole jab thing. Like if he's asked about it, obviously, yeah, he should answer it. But I don't think he should volunteer that information because, you know, they're just ready to smear him about that and call him something that he's not and that type of thing. But that message right there, the anti-war message, that is one of the issues that he's running on that is uniting people across political ideologies. So should Joe Biden be concerned? If I was Joe Biden, I would not dismiss RFK Jr. At this point, I would not. He's been on a lot of shows. He's getting more press, even though a lot of it is smears. He's still getting press. Remember, sometimes bad press is good press, boo. <laughs> Ask Eminem about bad press and how well that worked out for him. So he should be, He, I would be concerned. And I think pretending like RFK Jr. doesn't exist, I don't think that helps you, Biden. Thank you for the super chat, Eric. If I recall correctly, Sabby, aren't these polls that CNN and these other mainstream outlets using mostly talk to individuals with landlines? Yeah. Part of the reason why I'm not polled. <laughs> Thank you, Zach. Tell him that Tony the Tiger Obama was great. <laughs> Thank you for this as well, Zach. Michelle Mu would make a better president. LMAO is referring to Michelle uh, Wu. Uh, shout out to Chris Stegman for becoming a savvy member. Thank you so much. Big whoop whoop. Thank you, Darren. Got here late. Hi, Sabby. Thanks for all you do. Welcome. A kid says, Sabby, yes, on point. Please consider USA Empire Hollywood propaganda, continual push of American exceptionalism, makes it so that we believe the US in its right to do all the wrong it creates. That is true. Thank you for the super sticker, Baza. I don't know what that picture is. I don't know what that is. Huh, interesting. Is it a hat or a mask? I don't know. And thank you for this as well, Darren. Dear RFK, it's nuclear, not nuclear. <laughs> Damn. People do that though. I've heard people call it both ways. <laughs> both ways. Now, do I agree with his position on Israel and Palestine? Absolutely not. Hell to the no, 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 no. <laughs> he needs to, no, 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 no. <laughs> he needs to fix that. I'll take that comment um, on Rockfin, Eric. Thank you for the tip on Rockfin, old geologists. Bring it. And thank you for this tip, Roger Meadows. Anti-jab is not the win libs think it'll be. They'll keep mentioning the jab. They will F around and find out they'd be reminding us of mandates and Dems putting them on lockdown while they went and got their hair done, washed their clothes at a restaurant, French laundry, put small businesses out of business while no lockdowns for big business, all while having a jab forced on them. That's a good point, Roger. Very good point there. 